Welcome to the Kanoi Church Podcast. We're glad that you're interested in connecting through this teaching time. If you'd like to connect further, feel free to reach out to us through our website, kanoichurch.org. For now, enjoy this teaching from Kanoi Church, where our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Good morning. Well, we are continuing in our series today on the book of Acts. And Acts is this incredibly wonderful tale uh, about the start of the church, about the spread of the church. You know, Acts, we think, is written by, the, by Luke, the same Luke that wrote the book of Luke. And, uh, and so it's kind of a continuation. If Luke, the gospel of Luke, is about the life of Jesus and his, his death and his resurrection, uh, Luke continues writing this book of Acts to describe what life is like after Jesus ascends to heaven but leaves his disciples, his apostles, with this call to take his message to the ends of the earth. And so he chronicles this, this story about what happens next. And we meet some, some people that uh, we've never met before, like Saul. And in our our, ch- our chunk of scripture this morning in, in chapter 13, uh, Saul, who we've talked about the last two weeks, actually becomes Paul. That's the first time we see his name as Paul being used. But we also, in our, our section of scripture today, we hear about people like Peter, who we've already met before. Uh, James, the brother of Jesus, we've already met him before. And so what we see happening is the message of Jesus being taken all over the place. And what are some of the obstacles they ran into? What are some of the, the things that they did or priorities that they had that made the message spread so quickly? Um, and so in our series, what we're doing is we are specifically focusing on partnership. And, and I'll tell you why. We are focusing on partnership because when I planned this series months and months ago, uh, we had this big event coming up at the end of May called Be The Church Sunday. And what we've done for Be The Church Sunday in the past is our churches in Elizabethtown, rather than seeing each other as competition, rather than seeing each other as trying to get the same number of people or group of people to come to their church rather than somebody else's church, we've viewed one another as partners in the kingdom, in the work of Jesus in this town, in this area. And uh, and so our churches come together and we have a combined worship service with some songs we do some prayer and we have a a short lesson all together as churches and then and then we do something where we try to do church differently and instead of of just having a meeting where we're worshiping and we're praying and we're learning some about some scripture we're learning about something about jesus uh, then we take all of this and we use it by going into the community and doing service projects for our neighbors, for local businesses, for our public parks. Uh, we, we try to serve this community. We be the hands and feet of Jesus to the world around us. And, and now again, this isn't just our church, our uh, Kanoi community going in and, and doing these service projects. This is us partnering with all of the other churches in Elizabethtown to pull this thing off. And. We wanted to do a series that specifically looked at partnership as a way to help us uh, journey toward and journey into this event of Be The Church uh, Sunday. Now, again, the the event is is not going to happen. We're going to have to postpone it until the fall uh, because of everything with our quarantine, our lockdown right now. But that's okay because we can still talk about partnership. We can still prepare our hearts and our minds for partnership, and we can still do a better job at... Um, seeing one another not as competition uh, but as friends as fellow brothers and sisters as partners in this ministry we have that Jesus has given us and so we are looking at the book of Acts specifically at partnership and we are using the Bible project which is this absolutely fantastic website you should check out which is the bibleproject.com and uh, and what these two guys have done is use these God-given gifts they they have of, of teaching and also illustration of, of graphic design. And they present um, Bible studies, they present word studies, they do 
uh, Bible book overviews. I mean, just all sorts of, they do thematic things too, where they'll talk about like what's spirit in the Bible. And they'll do a whole video on this. They'll teach it, but they'll do it in a cartoon form. And you might hear the word cartoon and think, well, this is for kids. And the answer is absolutely not. Um, adults can learn from this just as much as anyone else. And in fact, I was introduced to this website and these guys when I was in seminary. And so it's, it's perfect for seminary students even too. Uh, and so I want to encourage you guys to check out that, uh, that website because it's phenomenal. And if you want to support them, please, by all means, uh, go for it. But we're using their overview on Acts as kind of a, a high view, like what's happening in a, a section of scripture in Acts. And then we're zooming in on specific stories in that section of scripture to say, here's where we see partnership. Or today, I'm actually going to talk a little bit more about some obstacles to partnership. And so we're really excited to continue exploring this. Uh, next week, Scott Boyer is actually going to be the one that shares uh, the teaching time with us. And I'm excited to hear uh, his thoughts on partnership as we wrap up the book of Acts. Why don't we just jump into the Bible Project Acts video for today. Please go to thebibleproject.com and look up the Acts 13 through 20 video. We're watching this, but due to copyright purposes, we'll not be putting this on YouTube. Please feel free to support thebibleproject.com. One of the things that I want to talk about today in relation to the book of Acts is, is that we see a number of partnerships in this chunk of scripture where Paul partners with a variety of people to get his message, his missionary um, message out there uh, to the world. And it made me think a lot about the people in my life who I'm lucky to have, who are friends, who are good friends, people that, that I go on walks with. We grab a cup of coffee and we go on a walk and sometimes we walk in places like this and other times it's through our town or through cities, through college campuses. We just, we walk and we talk and we share. Um, and that's something that we all need. We all need people in our lives that we are able to, to talk with, to sit with, to share with, to confide in, to be held accountable by. And sometimes the conversations that we have with them are conversations that are, are really good. You know, they encourage us, they, they keep us, um, they give us good advice. They, they give us the encouragement we need to just keep on going and sometimes the conversations that we have are more accountability. Like, hey, you know, you're making some decisions or the way that you're talking right now, uh, it leads me to think that maybe you're struggling in this area. Uh, and, and so they hold us accountable to things. And, and those conversations are less fun, but they are still really important and really necessary. We need people in our lives that we can partner with, that we can walk with, that we can journey with. And I don't know if you have those or not, but I would say that it's gotta be one of the imperatives in our day and age is to have people that you can trust that are taking this life journey with you, that are willing to share with you, that are willing to open up to you, that are willing to listen to you when you need someone to listen to. One of the things that can make partnership really difficult, and not just partnership, but I mean any relationship that you're in, whether that's with a coworker, it's with your spouse, or it is with somebody that you have an accountability relationship with, uh, deep friendship with, is it's conflict. Conflict gets in there, gets in the way, and it can get our hearts all kind of twisted up about another person. And so um, one of the things that I really appreciate about the book of Acts and about Luke's writing is that he's honest about conflict. He's honest that um, sometimes that happens in relationship. And so kind of throughout the book of Acts, especially the section of scripture that we are reading today, we see a number of conflicts going on. Uh, and they range from kind of interpersonal conflict all the way up to uh, a conflict even at the council at Jerusalem. Uh, and we'll talk about a couple of these things, but let's first talk about the council at Jerusalem. If you think back uh, a little while ago in the story in Acts, you'll remember that Peter had a vision where God came to him and essentially said that there were some unclean things in their Jewish history that um, that he is now making acceptable. He said, like, eat these things. He showed him a, a vision of some things that Jews were not allowed to eat historically because of what, uh, just the parameters that they had put on themselves or that God had put on themselves. And suddenly God kind of walks that back and says, Peter, these are okay now. And, and what he was doing was he was helping Peter see that his message was for the Gentiles. And so 
Uh, Peter went to Cornelius's house. Cornelius was a Roman officer. Uh, Cornelius and his entire household ended up accepting God. Um, the Council of Jerusalem is dealing with kind of the same thing. Paul and Barnabas are, they're out and they're doing their missionary work. They are spreading the word. They're sharing about who Jesus is and people are coming to know, know God. And one of the things that you sort of have to understand is that back in biblical times, if you were a Gentile, that is a non-Jewish person, then there was no reason for you to be in the synagogue, okay? And the synagogue is sort of like, it's sort of like a church. It's the place where the Jewish teaching would happen. It was kind of their holy place. And the only people that would go there are Jews. So when a rabbi would get up and do some teaching, then the synagogue would be full of Jews sitting to hear the teaching or uh, doing the learning about who God is. Now, Paul and Barnabas start going into these cities, these new places with this message about God. And where's the first place they go? The first place they go is to the synagogues. They go to the Jews and they get up and they begin to preach and teach about how Jesus is the Messiah. And of course, some of the Jews completely and totally accept this. They're excited about this message. They become believers in Jesus. Uh, some of the Jews, uh, they want to fight. They, this is blasphemy completely. Uh, however, one of the things that keep happening is that Gentiles begin to flock to this teaching because one of the things they're saying is that this teaching opens the door to people who were not Jewish historically or culturally um, to now become part of this religion, to worship Jesus. They're made right with God, essentially, is the message. And uh, the Jews do not like having their synagogues full of all these Gentile people, all of these non-believers, especially if the teaching is going to be blasphemous. And so I just want you to picture in your own head, what would it be like if there was a sign on the door of our church that said only a certain type of person was allowed through the doors? Actually, for some of you, you were old enough to remember when there was segregation and there were actual signs all over the place that said uh, only a certain type of person was allowed to use this water fountain. Only a certain type of person was allowed to use this door. And so there was a different door and a different water fountain for uh, different people with different colored skin. Well, this is sort of the same thing. There is this expectation that if you're going to be in the synagogue, you are going to be Jewish. And so uh, the Council of Jerusalem is kind of pulled together. It's all these elders. It's all these important folks, all these great thinkers who come together to decide and determine is what Paul and Barnabas are doing in their missionary journey. Okay. They're spreading this message. People are flocking to it. Synagogues are being filled up with the wrong person. Is that okay or not? And so there's a conflict. They're shouting back and forth. There's, there's heated disagreement. There's arguments. And, and Peter gets up. And this is where we see Peter again. You know, Peter, Peter was Jesus' right-hand guy. You know, he's the guy who had the vision where God said, hey, this is okay. You can eat from these things now. He gets up and he gives this speech letting people know, hey, you know my story. You know uh, the vision that I saw. You know that uh, I think this is okay. Uh, and then James gets up and he kind of reiterates the same sort of thing. And you might be wondering why, you know, are, are these two guys, like what's their role in the church, this, this council? So Peter was kind of the, the first leader of the church, but he's no longer the leader of the church. He has since kind of given up that role. And now the leader of the church is James. James, a brother of Jesus. And they call him James the Just. He is the new leader of the church. And so what you have is Paul and Barnabas coming to this council and they are trying to share what's happening, how God is doing this incredible work among a group of people that our cultural Jews are saying, no way, this is not for them and it's not okay. And the person who first gets up to say, I, I'm in agreement here, is the old leader of the Church of Jerusalem. Um, the Catholic Church would refer to Peter as the first pope, essentially. And then, if that wasn't enough, you know, the first leader, the well-respected first leader, sits down and the current leader gets up and also says this is okay. And so it, it sort of ends up um, settling the matter. 
and suddenly we don't see this conflict between whether or not um, Gentiles should be allowed to hear this message, whether Gentiles need to be circumcised physically or whether not. Like it's settled at that point from the Jerusalem Council. And that's, that's one conflict that we see show up. Now, here's, here's what I want to say. We're not always going to agree, all right? Not on everything. Um, I certainly don't expect that you'll agree with everything that I say even. But I would expect that we could do it, we could have discourse or disagreement in a method that would be honoring to each other. You know, when we read between the lines of the story in Acts, we can see that there's sort of heated exchange going on in this council. It's not, um, it's probably not the most civil thing that's going on. Well, we can do a better job than that. When we disagree, we can love one another well with our words and our actions and the way we disagree. So here's the second thing. Paul and Barnabas aren't alone. They have kind of in their corner, James and Peter. And so I wanna ask this question, who's in your corner? Not because you need to bring witnesses or you need to have somebody there to help you fight if you get into a disagreement with somebody, but just in your life, you know, as you go about life, as you struggle with a variety of things, like who is in your corner? Who is going to be there with you? Who's willing to speak up on your behalf? Who loves you well enough that they're going to help you on in this journey? Because Paul has Barnabas, Paul and Barnabas have Peter and James, and eventually they have the whole council. Who do you have? Let's talk about another conflict. One of the con conflicts that come up in this scripture passage is a conflict between Barnabas and Paul. And this is sort of the most famous conflict in the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas are going around on their missionary journey and things are going really well. Um, and they get to this point after the Council of Jerusalem where they're going to go back out and Barnabas wants to take John Mark with them. And John Mark is the same guy who wrote the book of Mark. Well, Paul doesn't want to take John Mark with them. And they end up having a disagreement over this. And so many people are always asking the question, why does Paul not want to take John Mark with them? Well, the honest truth of the matter is, some theories have it that John got sick, John Mark got sick. Um, and others have it that he had a theological disagreement with Paul and, and Barnabas in particular. And so, one of the reasons that people think is that they had a theological disagreement is because Paul doesn't want him to come back again. If he had just gotten sick, Paul probably wouldn't have the reservations about John Mark that he has. But it's not just that he got sick. John Mark wasn't sure that it was okay to be preaching the word to the Gentiles. He wasn't sure that it was okay that the Gentiles were flocking into the synagogues. He, he wasn't sure that Gentiles didn't have to be circumcised. But after the, the disagreement is settled by the council of Jerusalem, it's like John Mark changes his tune. And, and for Barnabas, that's good enough. John Mark has changed his mind. For Paul, Paul sees it more like if John Mark wasn't in before and he's only in now because he's got approval, I don't want him. He's too wishy-washy. And so Paul and Barnabas end up disagreeing on whether or not John should come with them on their missionary journey. And it's not a disagreement that they are able to come to terms on, essentially. Um, you know, the Greek word here for disagreement, it doesn't cast blame. There's no blame from this word on either party. And so we don't have a, we don't have an inkling to say that Paul was right or Barnabas was right in this. No idea. Um, what we can say is that there was a disagreement and they decided to part ways. And so I, I came out here to the woods today because I wanted to show you where the, cr the creek here splits. Barnabas and Paul split up. And so one of them goes this way. And one of them goes this way. And it's really easy for us to think that they just split up. They had irreconcilable different differences. They couldn't work their stuff out and they decided to be done. They split up. And what a sadness there is that they've split. 
But sometimes when you look at a split one way, you see that something has gone this way and something has gone this way. But if you look at it just a different way, you can see that God takes what feels like a split and he's using it for a singular purpose. See, even this creek all has water that runs to one place. When Paul and Barnabas split up, they take the message in different directions. And it's not like suddenly neither of them can do as good a job as they were doing before. It's like Barnabas takes John Mark and Paul takes Silas and they go these separate directions and the gospel is spread twice as much or twice as fast or in two different ways that they would have gone before. And so if you look at a split, you can say, okay, they went different directions. But another way to look at it is to say, well, they're flowing into the same body of water. That creek and that creek are going different directions, but they're all headed to the ocean. And God's using even the disagreements, even the conflict for his purpose, for his end goal. And that end goal was to take the message of the gospel to the ends of the earth. So there's a disagreement between Paul and Barnabas and the fact that they go their separate directions. This can be a little bit of a tricky one for us to, to even kind of bring into a sermon because, you know, like I said, in the Greek, it's not like either one of these guys is necessarily wrong in what they're choosing. And it doesn't seem like they worked it out and came to some sort of a compromise. They went their different directions and both of them had... Um, you know, their various ministry careers as they spread the gospel and they preached and they taught and they wrote. Sometimes conflict is resolved by going our separate ways. And I want you to think about that really hard because again, that's not necessarily a super easy teaching. Sometimes conflict is best resolved by going our separate ways because when we force ourselves to stay together despite our disagreement, we become bitter we become hard-hearted. Uh, we can even become malicious. Whether we intend to or we set out to be malicious or not, we can become malicious about another person. And I wanna be really clear here too because I'm not talking about marriage. What I am talking about is, is partnership. There may come a time when you are trying to partner with another entity or another church and it's just not gonna work out. You don't see eye to eye on enough things that it's going to make the partnership work. Or you might even feel like, look, Paul might have felt like Barnabas was was actually making a huge mistake by including John Mark. It wasn't just that he was frustrated that John Mark didn't believe before. Um, he was frustrated and he felt like it was a big mistake. And so maybe you feel like this other church, this other group of people, this other family, this other person that you know is making a big mistake. Um, sometimes the thing that you can do is, is go your separate way. And that doesn't mean forever. It just means, it means for now. It means that there's gonna be some separation that we need in order to see this thing worked out. Because later in the gospels, uh, excuse me, later in, in the epistles, we actually see Paul speak well of John Mark. And so perhaps sometimes it takes time. You know, when I'm doing premarital counseling with couples, we often talk about conflict because conflict is a reality. And if, if you ever think that you're gonna get married and you are not gonna have a conflict with the other person, I, I gotta, I mean, whew, we got another thing coming. Uh, and so one of the best uh, tools that I can give somebody is, is how do you work on conflict? How do you work out conflict? And, and one of the things that we will often talk about is sometimes it takes time. Sometimes you gotta walk away in order to come back. And so in this scenario, Paul and Barnabas go their separate ways. God uses what they're doing in these separate places in incredible ways. But they needed some time apart before Paul is able to at least come back and say, John Mark's done a good thing or John Mark is a good guy. All right, two more stories as we finish out our, our sermon this morning. And both of these stories have sort of the same point. One of the things that we see in this section of Acts is uh, we meet Priscilla and Aquila. And there's this story where this, this Jewish teacher comes to the synagogue and he's teaching and he's this really learned person. He's this great teacher. And um, he, he's teaching and Priscilla and Aquila, who've been trained by Paul, realize that he's missing some of his theology. Uh, some of it's not quite right. It's a little bit off, a little left to center, something like that. 
And, uh, and so they could have done a couple things. You know, like I said, he's a really well-known teacher. He's got his roots. They're deep, deep roots. Uh, he's, he's a good teacher. He's well-learned. He's got deep, deep roots. How, they could approach him in a couple of different ways when they realize that some of his teaching is off. And what they could do is they can make a big mess. They could call him out publicly if they wanted to. But instead, they don't. In the story, Priscilla and Aquila actually invite him over to their house for dinner and they share with them, him, what they know from Paul, what's been taught to them. And his response is positive. It's really incredible. Um, there's a story where Paul is invited to speak on a place called Mars Hill. And we've talked about this story before in our, I don't think in this sermon series, but in previous sermon series. It's called the Areopagus. And it's a place where um, philosophers and great teachers and scholars come to debate things. And Paul has been walking around the city of Athens and he's been preaching the gospel as he, as he knows it, as he's heard it, as he's learned it. He comes across the statue and the statue says to an, to an unknown God. And, you know, Athens is this incredibly religious place and it's full of religious statues everywhere, okay, of, of every single kind of God. And in some ways you can kind of think of it as they were just trying to cover their bases. They made sure that there was a statue or an altar to every single God out there. That way they could always call upon that God. There was no way that there was ever going to be a God who would like be angry at the city of Athens because they didn't worship that God. They would have an altar to every God to the point that they had an altar to the unknown God covering their bases. And so Paul, he could have gone into Athens and he could have uh, been terribly upsetting in the way that he portrayed the gospel. He could have gotten his megaphone out, stood on his soapbox and just yelled and shouted at the people. But rather than do that, when he's invited to Mars Hill, to the Areopagus, to debate and talk with all these philosophers and great teachers and scholars, he actually uses Athens and, and Greek's own history. In fact, he brings up the statue of, of to the unknown God. He says, let me tell you about that God. I know that unknown God. I know that God. Let me tell you about that God. That's the God above all gods. And then he actually, as he's explaining, he uses a line from some poetry, some Greek poetry. And so he takes part of their history and kind of weaves it into the story. You see, Paul could have taken all of these deep roots that is the Greek culture, and he could have just knocked down the tree and just made a massive, ugly, terrible mess. Priscilla and Aquila could have done the same thing. And while certainly what they shared probably did create a bit of a mess, and as you can see this tree that I was standing in front of, there's a gaping hole where that tree once stood in this trail. They could have just knocked down this tree, so to say, and left a mess. But instead, the way Priscilla and Aquila and the way Paul approaches this issue is, yeah, they knock down the tree, but they use it to create a bridge, a veritable bridge from one idea or one culture. You see, the way that we do conflict, whether it's with our fellow believers like Paul and Barnabas, or it is with people who are not believers in Jesus with us, like when Paul goes to the Areopagus, it really can shift how the gospel is received. Look, one of the biggest chances that Jesus took was saying, okay, I'm going to go back to my Father in heaven. I'm going to go prepare a place for you. And what I want you to do is take my message to the ends of the earth. And I want you to train disciples. I want you to spread my word. I want you to baptize them in my name. Because when Jesus gives us that authority and that call and that power, he's essentially saying, the way that you take me and the way that you portray me, the way that you talk about me, when you use my name, I am prepared to handle all of the junk and all the baggage and all the negativity that goes with it. And trust me, I'm sure that many of you guys know this from your interactions, either before you were a believer or even now that you are a believer. There are folks out there who call in the name of Jesus, who share about Jesus in a way that pushes people further away. And what's worse, or maybe it's not worse, it's just the same. When we do conflict and we do it really poorly, when we sever those ties, when we slam those doors, when we refuse to come to the table, when we see one another as competition and rather than partners, 
we are saying something about Jesus, especially when we claim to be Christians, especially when we do it on behalf of a church or a community or an accountability partner. And so as we wrap up today, my challenge is this. Conflict, like I just, I tell my couples in premarital counseling, conflict is gonna happen. There's not really any way to avoid it. Even with your best friend, conflict happens. We each need to find people who are willing to walk this journey with us, go on this life journey with us, who are gonna be our accountability, who are gonna be in our corner like Peter and, and James, who are gonna be our Barnabas as we travel along. And even when we disagree, we're gonna find a Silas. We need to handle our conflict in a way that honors and glorifies the name of Jesus and not just makes us feel better, makes us feel vindicated or makes us feel right. That, that means humility. That means sometimes giving up um, giving up our desire and our need to have it our way. That means compromise. But guys, it also means that we are choosing to value others as much as we value ourselves. That is what it means to be partners. That is what it, it's going to take for us to, to take the word of God and spread it throughout this world is going to be to partner with others, to see them not as competition, but as our wonderful brothers and sisters in this incredible endeavor to share the word of God with the world around us. So guys, let's do this thing as best as we can. I'm not saying we have to do it perfectly. We're never gonna do it perfectly, but here's what we can do. Together, we can hold each other accountable and we can lift each other up and we can be there for other people when they need us. Let's do that because this message that we have to share and to spread, it's worth doing that. Let's pray. Hi, this is Pastor Nick. Thanks for listening. I hope something that you heard today was very helpful. If you want to connect with us further, feel free to check us out on Facebook, Instagram, or our website, kanoichurch.org. Sure, I'm glad we're in this together.